Yeah, no, I got it cut yesterday at my favorite barbers in Uptown Chicago. Yeah, no, they've not seen it yet. I'm going to do a, a big reveal in about one second time. I got my hair cut yesterday, everyone. Woo! This, it's been six months since I did it. It's almost as if we've moved into a house and got a dog in that time. And ironically, because I let it go so long, I ended up looking like a dog. And honestly, while I was in there, at the very moments that my barber tried to make small talk with me, a nightmare, I just gave thought to some of the differences between British and American barber visits. And while I was in there, having my beard trimmed by somebody that I trust with my life, because sometimes you have to, I, I started thinking quite deeply about some of those differences. And at first I couldn't think of any. I mean, the hairdressers is the hairdressers, isn't it? But listen, I've lived in the United States for about 15 years and due to laziness, I average about three haircuts a year, meaning that I've had about 45 US haircuts, 44 by professionals and one by my wife during the pandemic. In other words, yesterday was not my first time. And while we're on the subject, if this is your first time visiting Lost in the Pond and you haven't had a chance to subscribe to this channel, do that now. And so yesterday, as my hair went from how it appears in this AI rendering of me, because I've got to do a before picture, to this actual rendering of me, I managed to come up with four subtle differences between British and American barber visits. Now, for my non-male audience, just a heads up that a lot of these things are going to be quite male-centric because I'm both male and centric. But I do think there are some tidbits, to use the American spelling, for everyone. So let's pull out the scissors and get stuck in. Not literally. Now, when I first moved to America, I used to get my hair cut at a spectacular little place called Great Clips, which is a sort of low-cost hair salon chain. But in recent years, I've settled upon my own barbershop. Not my own barbershop. I don't own it. This is just a barbershop here in Chicago that I like. And while it is my third favorite place in the whole of Chicago, there was something I noticed about it the very moment that I made a booking. It was the cost. It sort of seemed like things were a bit more pricey here than they would be back in Britain. But then I thought about it, I was like, well, we do live in Chicago, which obviously makes me go high pitch for no reason. And therefore, you know, things will be a bit on the higher side. So I looked this up. The average cost for a male haircut in the United States is about $30. And weirdly, my wife thinks that's cheap. She doesn't know how hard we've got it. But in Britain, I don't remember spending much more than 15 pounds. And I looked this up too. The average cost of a male haircut in Britain today is in fact 19 pounds. And I know what you're thinking. Ooh, Lawrence, how much is that in dollars? And the answer to that is, hold on, about 25 to 26 dollars. And the rate might be higher in London. It definitely is. So there you go, in this incredibly scientific comparison between the two countries, Britain comes out the cheapest. I've just realized America is absolutely massive and prices are gonna fluctuate wherever you are in the land. But on average, that's it. <laughs> Ah yes, my old friend, words and terminology, because when it comes to things that were lost in the pond, words and terminology are usually at the top of the list, and the same is true right here when it comes to the hairdressers. As a matter of fact, that there is an example. Whereas both countries have the profession of a hairdresser, in Britain we refer to the actual physical place where you get your hair cut as the hairdressers. And as far as I can tell, Americans don't typically use that word in this context. Instead they might say, the salon, except they place the emphasis on the second syllable, as in the cilantro. Cilantro. It sounds like cilantro. Now, sadly, my hair is long since too receded to ask my barber to apply the next word to my haircut, because that next word is fringe, as in the hair that comes down to here. In America, those are known as bangs plural. And you know those metallic things that keep your hair in place that my wife always leaves on the bathroom floor? She refers to those as bobby pins. Mm -mm, not me. I call that a Kirby grip when I have cause to talk about hair accessories. Same with a hair slide. Americans call this a barrette, apparently. Both countries will call a headband a headband, but British people might sometimes refer to it as an Alice band after the headband worn by Alice in Wonderland. That all, it all rhymes. And what Americans call a hair tie, in other words, those elastic things that you often find down the back of the sofa. Is that just me? British people will sometimes refer to as a bobble. And you're probably thinking, Lawrence, when did you become so knowledgeable about hair accessories? And I, I looked it all up on Wikipedia five minutes before we started. And finally, ginger versus redhead. Those are not hair accessories. They are, in fact, just a color of hair. That's right. Somebody who has red hair, which is apparently 6% of Scottish people, are often referred to as ginger in the UK. Whereas the descriptor here, more often than not, is redheaded or redhead. And 
of course, with that comes differing attitudes. Because in Britain, we don't just use the word ginger as a descriptive term. It's often used in a derogatory fashion. You see, I had this friend who I used to hang out with called Derek at school football practice, and nobody would pick him to be on the team, partly because he was rubbish and also because he was ginger. You know, people have been physically attacked in Britain for having red hair. In America, this prejudice doesn't seem to exist because it's just someone's hair color. What are we doing? Who decided that this was a thing? And I don't have the answer to that. But what I can tell you is that this weird association goes back a long time. As long ago as 1885, the English novelist Wilkie Collins wrote, the prejudice against habitual silence among the lower order of the people is almost as inveterate as the prejudice against red hair. <laughs> Oh, and while we're on the subject of colourful things, that brings us on to this. Red, white and blue. Many know these as the colours that comprise the national flags of both Britain and America. But they also make up the twirling stripes on a barber's pole. Appropriate then that barber poles can be found outside of establishments in either country, leading Uncle Toby to type, But Lawrence, this video is about differences, not similarities. <laughs> Well, something that I forgot to mention is that barber poles are often red, white and blue in the United States, but not in England. You see, it all dates back to shortly after a time when your barber and your surgeon were the same person. In 1540s England, a newly formed fellowship by the name of Company of Barbers and Surgeons passed a statute insisting that barbers must differentiate themselves from surgeons through the use of a red and white pole. And it worked! Because these red and white poles are still used in England today, I never once confused the person giving me a short back and sides with the person removing my appendix, which is a big win. And while these glorified peppermint sticks can also occasionally be found in America, the red, white and blue pole appears to be vastly more popular. Legend has it that the red was chosen to represent arterial blood, blue to represent venous blood, and the white to represent a bandage. But let's face it, they actually represent America. Just like the world's tallest barber's pole found in Forest Grove, Oregon. What's the matter with you? And finally, the small talk. And anybody that knows me knows that I don't do particularly well in this area. Which admittedly is unusual because I only got my hair cut in the first place because in about 10 minutes time I'm about to go live on Australian TV. In fact, by the time this video goes out it will have already happened, hence what you're seeing there. But small talk at the barbers is something that I've always struggled with. You know the kind of thing. So, you having a nice weekend and you have to think about it a little bit because if you say no, then that invites more conversation and drama. So you end up saying, yeah, not bad. And when I lived in England, I feel like this social reticence at the barbers, as well as other elements of public life, was just a part of our culture. In America, it does exist, but not on the same level. Like for instance, when I visited yesterday, it was a really lively and bustling place. And this is because not only were the customers and the barbers having back and forth conversations, but the other barbers and customers were joining in with my conversation which in a way was useful because it took the pressure off me and I could just sit there and mentally plan this video so everyone's a winner. Except one guy, and this is a true story, who turned up, saw that the barbers had left dog treats outside for doggies and stole them. He ran up the road and one of the barbers chased after him and got it back. It was the most dramatic thing I've seen in a barber shop since Shawn Michaels turned on Marty Jannetty. About four people are going to get that reference. Anyway, I've just remembered that my barber is aware of this channel, so there's a good chance that he is watching. So if you are, everything that I've just said was a joke for the purposes of humour. And you are in fact a very good barber with a veritable array of conversational implements. I've no idea what that meant. But that's it for this episode. Let me know in the comments below if you've ever had a haircut and what it was like. I'm Lawrence Brown. You can follow me on social media in the links in my description. And if you haven't yet seen my first ever live TV interview, do that now. These videos are made possible by my patrons and YouTube members. If you would like to become a YouTube member, you can do that today by clicking the join button or as always go to patreon.com slash lost in the pond. Until the next video, goodbye.